It is the middle of the coldest winter in living memory in Afghanistan. Over 900 people have died from the cold here so far this season. Roads are blocked by deep snow and snowstorms and blizzards have grounded the helicopters. I'm on the first chopper in two weeks that's been able to reach this remote US base at Zormat in the eastern border province of Paktia. Despite the extreme conditions, the war here in eastern Afghanistan is still being fought. As soon as I arrive, I join these troops from the US 82nd Airborne, heading out for a 10-day patrol in temperatures that at night, on the high plateaus, drop to minus 30 Celsius. Their greatest fear, IEDs, improvised explosive devices, an increasingly common form of attack learnt from their devastating success in the Iraq insurgency. 61 IEDs from uh, mid-September through uh, late November, and uh, Ballpark, about 120, 130 uh, mortar rounds and rockets fired at us. Yeah. Small arms fire is uh, far and few between. They really don't want to stay. They don't want to stay and fight toe to toe with us. Yeah. You know, so they do a lot of a lot of harassment fire, hit and runs, and uh, they tend to uh, they tend to attack the most uh, during uh, like full moons or the, when the loom cycles on the high end. I think it's full moon at the moment. Isn't it? It's uh, pretty close, so uh, you know they say with a full moon. So uh, we'll see what happens. I think uh, due to the cold weather and the ice and snow in the passes and the uh, their uh, inability to maneuver the ground during the during the winter time like they did during the summer, they pretty much lay low or uh, go to a, a safe haven. At one stage, this unit had lost more than half its transport to IEDs. Travelling with the US troops are members of the Afghan police and army. The Americans say that the Afghans are leading the operation, but in reality, they only act as support for the US troops. The soldiers set up on a snow-covered plain for the night. They want a clear field of view so that they can see any enemy approaching. We're looking right, right at him. And on my elevation. This is a staging area. We're getting ready for the operation, which will yeah. kick off tomorrow morning. Right now, we're just making sure that we have the uh, the perimeter secure and get all all the uh, the team members with the, inside our uh, our perimeter. As night falls, the Afghan troops refuse to sleep in their cold open trucks. They move into villages in the area demanding shelter with the local people, spoiling any chance of surprise for the operation. All right, we'll be here till uh, late late tonight, early, early morning, sometime, time to be determined. We'll move out and, and stage. As dawn breaks after a freezing and sleepless night, they move out to start the operation. They start to search the first target of the day. It's a compound called a kalat. Like most Afghan houses, it is built like a fortress with high walls on all sides. All right, there's cows and stinky shit in there. <laughs> so far, just mainly ammo, sir? Yeah. <laughs> Before too long, they find a pistol. Yeah. 
He said that that is broken, you cannot shoot with that uh, something, therefore we don't count that. That's right. the best story. The point is, we need him to be honest with us, all right? If he's not honest with us and we find stuff, then he's being detained and he's taken up to Gardez. All right, just, it's the bottom line. The soldiers aren't convinced and confiscate the weapon. He's asking about the pistols so we can turn it back to them. They said we will fix it. <laughs> That's what we're afraid of. There was a problem with uh, the honesty at the beginning. We asked if there was a weapon in the house and we were told no there wasn't and we found one so that's why we're keeping the pistol. Because of the lawlessness in this part of Afghanistan, each household is allowed to have one weapon. If they are declared to the searching troops, they are in most cases allowed to keep them. If they are hidden or the people lie about them, they are confiscated. Or Chinese, what's that, the family? The soldiers tell me it is common to find weapons in these underground cellars. If you go down there, it's like, it's just, uh, you know, it's just a great place to hide stuff. It's deep, it's, you know, secluded and inconspicuous. There are almost no military age males in this village. They probably knew the Americans were coming and have fled. Swallowed up. Hey. They know where we're turning, where we're going, which way we're headed. They know well in advance. Yeah. So you reckon they would have gone if they were here? I would think so. They probably probably caught wind yeah. of uh, something going down. We were only a few kilometers away when we staged last night, and. Uh, we find a lot of collats, we'll find weapons and ammo, and when we get here, you know, you'll find uh, women and children, no, uh, no adult males, no military age males, and the common, uh, common story we get is uh, during the wintertime, the, uh, the males go to India or Pakistan, you know, someplace else to work, and then the families are left here. Which could be true. It could, it could be. There's, there's probably a lot of truth in that, yeah. you know, and it's the, uh, unfortunately, it's the, honest, it's the honest people out here trying to make a living that are uh, affected by the handful of Taliban running around doing stupid stuff. Yeah. At the next collect, they start to uncover a lot more. Before we give this up, ask him if he's got any weapons. We'll find out if he's lying to us right away. That one home. Huh? The owner of the house denies he has any weapons. The black thickens. <laughs> no weapons. Guess what's in there? That'd be no ammo. Oh, yeah, it's getting. All right. Check this one. Yeah, more. come on. Oh, oh, oh good. Now we're in trouble. This guy might be uh, our first detainee. The guy who's got no fucking he's got a world supply of shit. This guy's getting detained. Roger, I think we just got our first winner. Uh, we're kind of in the last cool out of the series. Uh, we're finding just an ass load of stuff, mostly small arm stuff, but it's a pretty good stockpile over. The weapons, 
an old rifle, a pistol, an AK-47 and some grenades mount up. Let them know, we asked him once before if he had any weapons. He lied to us because obviously we found all this stuff here. This is his chance to be honest, ask him if he's got any more stuff any place else in the kulak because we're going to find it. A normal saw blade is seen by the soldiers as potentially being part of an improvised explosive device, the most common and effective method of attacking foreign forces in Afghanistan. Makes the uh, electrical connection on a uh, pressure plate. Okay. Two pieces of uh, two saw blades with a gap. You drive over it, the two pieces of metal make contact, sends the current and detonates the mine. Yeah. This has been this has been a huge uh, what I need to do, I need to get this done. Uh, no, this has been a key piece with uh, all our pressure plates. They've all had they call it the Zormont saw. They've all had saw blades. But this is a farm after all, and a saw is a household item. Hey, that's soldier of fortune. <laughs> I've already been in that magazine. Yeah. <laughs> Haven't we all? The commander of the base, Lieutenant Colonel Woods, comes to inspect the weapons. It is not much, but it is something to show for their work so far. That is API, of course the frags. The uh, story of the guy we detained is that this was all left over from the, from the Russian invasion, but API is not 30 years old and they got no, Chinese ammo in there. Those frags so. aren't 30 years old either. It's all a little new for that. Right. Nice cache, so. shotgun shells, the whole deal. Some of the ammunition is armor piercing. They are convinced the old man is Taliban. Military age males? Males? They're not. Very few, sir. So, you know, that's probably not enough in and of itself to throw a guy in the truck, but we kept the ammunition anyway. If this and this is. <laughs> that shit is scary. <laughs> um, the hand grenades. Uh, not something to someone have it for a security or in scum. All right, Jay Bird. Hey, good work. You guys, good job on the whole team out here. It's awesome. The operation will continue like this for another nine days with searches and detentions of anyone who tries to hide weapons. I head back to base with Lieutenant Colonel Woods. I asked the Lieutenant Colonel exactly how he thinks he can change the allegiances of the people. That's the question we talk about too. How do you change someone that is, that, that is grown up in that? How do you do that? I, I think you have to look, I think we have to look at some of our own experiences at home. How do you turn communities from, 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 you know, from, from bad to good? How does that happen? It happens over time. It takes, you know, it takes one, like you said earlier, it takes legitimate uh, government body. It takes a legitimate police force that isn't, that isn't stealing from you. And I think you have to show them that the government has more to offer than the insurgency does. The rhetoric has changed. Field commanders like Woods no longer talk of wiping out the Taliban or hunting down the terrorists. The language now focuses on the US military's emerging theories on counterinsurgency, honed in the wars in Iraq and now Afghanistan. Why has this strategy evolved in this way? Um, is this, has the US military recognized this is the only way to win this conflict? Mm -hmm. You know, we had to come in initially, you know, and in, in, in remove insurgent threats. You know, they were, they were a direct threat. Well, now those threats have gone to ground. They're hiding. I mean, they, they're not winning here. They can't win here. The US Army, as far as involvement, yeah, we've evolved. You have to evolve. If you, if you don't evolve, you're useless in this business. You've got to constantly look at ways to do it better, do it different. The next morning, the Lieutenant Colonel wants to show me how he's winning. It's not dead or captured Taliban, 
It's 400 Afghans working on a road paid for by the US military to stop them working for the other side. The Taliban tried to stop it through verbal threats and over the radio and to, to, and to, to leadership, and they couldn't do it. What is the Taliban going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to go out here and do what? Shoot people? You're going to go out here and kill them? So any, any, any support that you had in the area or any people that are on the fence just went completely the other way. Yeah. You can't kill men with shovels out here working to put food on the table for their families. So you think you're that smart? What's that? You're not smarter than I don't, I'll never say we're smarter than because, you know, like, like we talked about before, yeah. how you have to evolve continuously in this counterinsurgency fight. He'll figure something out, and then, and then we'll figure something out. Down the road, the Afghan special forces and their foreign advisors are fighting the war in a different way. Last night, they surrounded and stormed a nearby compound where they believed Taliban leaders were hiding. They found no Taliban, and all they achieved was the resentment of the occupants. The same resentment the Lieutenant Colonel is trying to overcome with his programs. So you were here last night? Yeah. Yeah, did you, did you find anything? Uh, I cannot tell you that, you know, because yeah. <laughs> it's maybe classified, you know. Oh, okay. Without my team permission, I would not share this. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. No problem. Yeah. No problem. I'll ask one. But it was really cold. <laughs> it was really cold, yeah. As usual, on the advice of their US trainers, special forces don't speak to the press. But before the counterinsurgency can work, nature has thrown some obstacles in its path. These men will be out here for days, sleeping in their vehicles, protecting themselves from a population that is at best wary of them and at worst is trying to kill them. We were actually going to use that to sleep in, yeah. uh, pile a couple guys in it to stay warm. Yeah. That way, uh, uh, you know, one, they're out of the element and then two, they can actually you know, somewhat sleep. Back at the base at first light, these soldiers are getting briefed on a new assignment. TCs in your vehicle, make sure you got good PID before you release any weapons. Uh, the provincial governor is scheduled to meet the local elders at the town hall. Try to use the smallest weapon possible. We've got a lot of civilians over there in these areas. Those larger weapons are going to carry in and will have too much collateral damage. A wide security perimeter is thrown around the town hall to prevent suicide bombers attacking the meeting. The governor of Paktia, like most of Afghanistan's governors, is appointed by the president, Hamid Karzai, and has little power other than the support of the foreign forces. There are constant threats and attempts on his life. This is the first time he has ever come to meet the elders here. Under heavy security, some local leaders list their grievances to the governor. Many have not come out of fear and hatred for the governor and the foreign forces who protect and support him. Others complain of the conduct of the Afghan forces on operations here. The US commander and the governor 
listen uncomfortably to the litany of complaints against their forces. Again and again, I hear how angry Afghans are becoming and that the source of their anger is their treatment in the ongoing operations. But Lieutenant Colonel Wood says the troops are just doing their jobs. We follow the, the land of law warfare, we follow the rules of engagement, and we teach that to our soldiers, and we teach it over and over, and we teach it to our ANSF counterparts as well. Because not only our mistake will set us back, a mistake they could make can also set the, set the entire uh, uh, process back. That's what you tell them every day. What do you say to your men who go out there every day facing IED attacks and small arms fire um, to make them go on, to make them continue, to make them not respond in a way that's going to jeopardise the progress right. that's been made? Well, the, I think the first thing you do is you thank them. You thank them every single day because they, they, they've joined. Most of these kids in, this, in the business have joined after 9-11. They came here for a reason. All of them have a reason. Whether they express it or not, they have a reason. Most of them are re-enlisting here. I've got better re-enlistment here than I have in the United States. It's because they believe in what they're doing. So you have to thank them, first of all. The second thing you have to do is you have to explain to them the, the counterinsurgency fight, how we're trying to achieve victory, how we're trying to bring this whole thing together to, to achieve victory. And then I think you have to remind them, too, look, you're giving people something that they've never had. You're giving them freedom. You know, maybe not your version of freedom, like you have back home, or, or, or my version I have back home, yet. But that freedom is coming, and it's coming every single day. And they're providing that. They are providing the underpinning so those that can happen. And, and that's how, what you tell them. And you, you got to tell them, you know, the costs have been high to be here. We can't afford to go backwards because of a single, you know, incident or a mistake that we make. But with the Afghan war entering its seventh year and more than 6,000 Afghans killed in the past 12 months, it seems any freedom will be a long time coming for the people of Afghanistan.